Hello, this is the three C's of social emotional learning. I am Glenn W. Hunter. With us, we have Shore Denny, president of Community Now, a leading social emotional learning service provider in the Inland Empire here in Southern California. And today, we have a special guest, Julie Churcher, RN, who practices in Minneapolis, St. Paul. She's here, uh, her focus is mental illness, and she's here to give us um, some insight considering uh, she's based in one of the hot spots um, of this current situation in the United States where we just seem to uh, continue to um, have individual trauma and definitely uh, a lot of trauma in the community uh, where we all seem to live, or at least a lot of big cities. Sure, Julie, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> so, well, let's jump right into this. So, sure, you know, with the three C's, community, collaboration, communication, we have the opportunity to look at what's going on in different communities. We see some common problems that are going on nationwide, and it's creating common pain. The pandemic started some of it, that led to quarantine, which escalated it. But you know, we've been at this a while. Why is the country exploding now? Wow, I love that intro. There are so many reasons, right? I'm gonna throw out number one, that we've been pimped up for three months. Some of us, you know, some of us less and some of us more. There's a lot of emotion that goes with that. And then I'm gonna, throw it out to community trauma. I think that there's, this has been very traumatic. The pandemic, the illness is traumatic as we've been talking about. And then um, we have the, the just senseless killing that is going on of, of people of color, men of color specifically. And I think that it was just, all of it came together at one time. The nation is tired. We wanted to be out in the streets, we're out there and we're protesting for something that we believe in. Um, Julie, what, I mean, you're right there. You are in Minneapolis right now. I mean, Minnesota, Lori, and you are in St. Paul where all of this is going down. And I know that you've had, you know, you've seen a lot. You've, you've lived through a lot there. What's going on? Well, you guys, it's, it's pretty bad here. You know, I feel like um, the system has finally reached this point where people are feeling like they need to speak up. Um, they're going to have their voices heard by any means necessary. We as a people are standing together for the first time in a long time. And I feel like for Minnesota, it's one of the most segregated states. Um, you know, the gap between the rich and the poor is huge here. Um, I feel like people have just had enough. Our people have had enough. And then with the unfortunate murder of George Floyd in our in our state, you know, it's just, it's caused a big uprising, you know, and like I said earlier, people express themselves differently, you know, so we got some violent protesters, we got some, some, some peaceful protesters, but at the end of the day, everyone is coming together. You know, there's a lot of a lot of small businesses that were affected as well. So people are stressed and people have had enough and they want they want to see, you know, our black men stop being killed, period. So I'm I'm actually happy to see Minnesota rise to the occasion and I'm with them. Power to the people. What what think of the trauma, right? The trauma to get us where we are right now and the trauma that's coming from where we are right now can you can you speak on that what yeah definitely you know from my perspective you know protesting and rioting revolutions have been a part of you know our culture for decades right so um we and we as black people have you know we have to have our face on at all times we're afraid to show emotion um we don't want to show people that we're anxious we don't want to show people that were sad. We already feel like we're up against so much already. So, you know, I'm a nurse and as a healthcare provider, I have to look at it um, and I, I challenge all of my nurses out there, people in healthcare, to look at the trauma that is already existing, you know, before 
this actually happened, you know, and then even with peace, peaceful protesting, you, have, you know, it, it does cause, you know, a stimulation of anxiety, it can cause, you know, post traumatic stress. Um, it can cause underlying mental health issues to arise that, you know, have kind of been laying at bay for a while. So um, it, it's just being aware and being educated and, um, you know, knowing that you have to pick it apart. It's not just one thing or another. It has so many layers to it. And you really got to, you really got to get in there and, and do the work if you want to help people and you got to meet them where they're at. You know, Julia, I like, the part you talked about the layers that are there. You know, I think from a mental illness perspective, it's easy to say, here's the problem, here's the diagnosis. And the reality is so much more complex. Yeah. I think as we're looking at this community that needs healing, I think the issues are very complex. I think you articulated the economic disparity, which actually causes a lot of trauma that's largely unseen until someone lights the powder keg. I think also what we're seeing there is, um, frankly, a, a little bit of um, poor behavior from law enforcement. Um, the officer responsible for uh, the killing um, has a history of being outside of the lines that hasn't been addressed. So you look at those con um, considerations, and I think you look at the fact that it happened in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, and then we realize this isn't a local problem. There are national footprints to this because it spread so rapidly. And um, I've had the fortune or misfortune of having lived through a couple of riots. They don't last this long normally. Mm -hmm. There are some deep-seated issues that need to be addressed, I think, at the individual level so that our communities can heal and start moving forward. And that's not going to happen overnight. Yeah. Being on the front line, Julie, what, what do you think um, is going to help start the healing? Because there are people hurting in your community. Absolutely. Well, first of all, I think that our leaders have to be transparent. You know, they have to admit that there is an absolute problem first. And they have to not just say there's a problem, they have to break it down so that our people can hear it. They have to say, you know, we haven't treated you guys equally. You know, we're, we're, we're putting in motion some things to change that. Um, they have to let us know that they care about us, um, that we are important to the community. Um, and once they're able to reach the, the numerous, you know, people with that state, with those statements, I hope that they would be able to start to change the system, which means um, here, I think there needs to be more African Americans in leadership, you know, in, in a lot of our companies and hospitals, there's we're outnumbered, you know. Um, I feel like in healthcare, you know, you know, I live in a rural state, so they're they're all rural nurses that are caring for people who have a lot of culture. So I feel like, you know, people need to go through trainings, cultural competency and not just one time to meet a four-hour expectation. I feel like it needs to be ongoing. I feel like the police also need this. I feel like, you know, when Philando Castell got killed, he got killed six blocks from my house. That's considered a suburb, but he was actually, you know, that's six blocks from the inner city, and he was killed by a suburban cop, but that suburban cop had no, no training like so they're afraid of our people is how I feel wow. and afraid of us to act in wow. in terror and they're going to shoot before the talk and they're going so until the system starts to change how they're trained and and try to weed out some of the bad ones at the beginning um, it'll continue to grow, but I think that's a good place to start. Wow. I, I, has really, to start in leader. I really appreciate how you did identify leaders, but also identified the training foundation. I mean, there has to be a knowledge that keeps up with the, uh, with the challenges. Otherwise, you have people who are equipped to solve yesterday's problems. You know, you know and I think really when you start thinking about yesterday's problems, they're not as complex as they are now. You know, sure, if you think about the youth that you serve, 
I mean, not only are they multicultural, they come from multicultural communities. They come from multi-generational families. There are so many factors that tie in to them showing up in a classroom and then trying to learn among a bunch of peers that have similar issues with different backgrounds. When you deal with those young folks and trying to help them cope with the trauma they brought with them, uh, what are some of the um, bird whistles that you get that really sort of signal that here is a, a special person that really needs some correction in order to contribute their gifts? Um, I mean, it, all kids need that, right? So if we're going to talk about, uh, I'm trying to understand your question. If you're saying like if youth come out that have um, come from families that are talking in a more of a racist way, and they're coming into a multicultural school surrounding, um, what do we see? And to alert us that that is the way that youth is, it would be their language, it would be their body, uh, you know, the, the way that they're talking, the way that they're standing, the, you know, all of that. Um, I think that the right now the key is to tell our youth, to show our youth through our actions, the unity. Right now, out of all of these horrific things, the one good thing about and the reason that this thing is lasting so long is because our Caucasian friends have gotten involved. Our Hispanic Latina friends are now involved. Our um, um, LGBTQ are now involved. All people are coming together and saying with the same voice that enough is enough. And that's what the protests are now. So for our youth, what they, hopefully they will be seeing amongst all of the wreckage that is considered shame. I think we could do a conversation. I have a whole nother show on um, maybe why some of this is necessary, what's going on right now. You know, I mean, it's, it's horrendous. No one's ever going to say, oh yeah, I'm glad somebody's business has been broken into. Or, you know, that there are reasons, there are underlying traumas that are going on. And, and in fact, I'll make the case that right now that some triggers are going off and some of the people that were out there didn't even realize that they did what they did. You know, that it, 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 it happened from the energy around them of what's going on, um, community trauma, uh, you know, that they're all being impacted. But for our youth, it would be camaraderie. It would be love and understanding that, when they leave their home, that they're coming out into an environment that is together, that is looking at us as one. Um, just as there are all of these horrible, horrible people that want um, segregation or want us separated or want this hate, there are more, indeed many more, who want love, who want togetherness, who want a fair system. And I think the challenge is breaking, uh, breaking maybe not even breaking, but changing our system to something that is equal for all, that our youth can be proud of. My youth right now in my home, they believe it's already equal. All of this is, you know, starting to change their mind, but they had a fantasy world that they lived in where we were in an America that was free. Um, let's make that reality. Wow. So we have some work to do because that means we're going to have to change behaviors uh, for empowered people who may not be willing to release some of that, um, that authority, some of that power. But I think what we're seeing now nationally is that there is a, a loud voice clam clamoring um, to be heard, to earn respect, or in some cases to be destructive, to make sure that you realize that there is power within not just the communities, but within the individual. You know, I think looting is a way of ex uh, expressing the desire to be heard, but I think we're also seeing with, with the, the chanting and particularly the multi-generational, the multicultural stances that are being put, whether it's a, one crowd attacking another crowd because they're misbehaving, all the way to standing tall against law enforcement because, well, the good officers have a sense that this isn't what they signed up for. They're here to protect the community. And now we have officers and beyond um, the former officer Chauvin, but beyond him, there are those that are out of bounds. They're misbehaving and we're seeing it um, on the news every night. But to bring it back to the fact that this is happening in multiple communities, we wanna go back to, uh, to Julie. 
in the sense that being in Minneapolis, St. Paul, you're not in one of the major metropolises. It's not LA, it's not New York, it's not Atlanta that have, um, have seen the, you know, have, that have burned before. But you have um, a community that evidently there is a sense of a very sense of pride, sense of pride, and um, and, and and the common culture there. What do you think the implications of all this disruption is going to have on just people being neighborly on the back end of this? Hmm. You know, um, already we've seen, you know, lots of riots. Uh, many of our major streets and businesses have been burned down. Most of our malls are boarded up. Um, and uh, food has become an issue. Um, so currently, we're seeing uh, communities get together, um, coming together in different areas around town, um, providing food, pop-up, you know, food shelters for people. Um, so there's been a great sense of community so far. Um, my worry is what a lot of people's worry is, is that, you know, like you said, causing a ruckus, setting things on fire, you know, that's one way to express things, to get things heard. Um, I, I'm nervous that it's going to shift to, you know, all the destruction that was caused um, or, you know, all the, these people that they're saying are coming into town causing this destruction. Was it the KKK? Is it this or that? The, the, the topic and the theme is kind of shifting from police brutality to, um, you know, the, the damage that's being done in the city and all these extra conspiracy theories that go along with it, right? So I'm hoping that, you know, I, I'm, like I said earlier, I'm happy to see my city rise up, but I'm also um, hoping that we can bring it back together in a peaceful way so that our voices can still be heard and that we won't be shunned upon as as we typically are, if I can be frank, uh, violent and, you know, ignorant and not able to, you know, express ourselves and we got to get the job done. So we got to, I mean, I get it, but we got to have both. And I hope that, you know, we can empower each other to just stand there, stand up and, um, and, and have our voices heard and be taken seriously. But the, the sense of community right now is excellent. So hope we can keep that going. And for people in your community, what would be some coping strategies that you would give um, if someone's watching right now and they're they're panicking or you know they're anxious or depressed? Do you have any uh, local in your area outlets or any anything that you could tell us right now to help those um, that are in need right now? Yeah, you know. As far as mental health goes, it's it's hard to gain access to mental health in Minnesota as it is. Mm -hmm. um, there there are some crisis lines, um, the Ramsey County Crisis Line and Cope for Hennepin County, C O P E, that would come out and uh, try to de-escalate any crises and get people the help that they need. Um, you know, for coping skills, I have to say you have to unplug. You know, stop watching the TV. Um, it's like watching a a bad Netflix series that you can't turn off, you know, it's like, I have to force myself to just say, I'm not even going to watch it today, because it really does something to your soul. I mean, and mm. we're all walking around with our head a little bit down right now, hoping for the best. Um, but I would say, you know, unplug, you know, right now with the pandemic, we can't go out and do much, but even taking a small walk, even um, spending time, you know, you know, FaceTiming people on, on chat groups um, that you can't be around or reaching out to family, um, you know, just, just the small things that you appreciate. I mean, cracking a joke here and there, laughter helps decrease stress as well, you know, just the simple things. But I mean, doing it with intention is super important. And again, we don't, we don't typically do things with intention. They just happen on an accident if somebody tells us a joke. But doing some of this stuff with intention can really help our mind, body, and, and, and soul to, you know, be at peace and, and keep moving forward and being strong how we need to be right now. So just remembering those things. Deep breathing always works. Um, just taking a minute to breathe in for four counts. 
pause for four counts and breathing out for four counts, it, it really does a lot to help reduce, um, reduce stress. And if people would try it, they would see that it is true. So I strongly encourage that for sure during these times for everybody. Wow. I love the way you get back to the fundamentals. Breathe. Literally yeah. breathe. And so from a fundamental standpoint, you know, sure, what, what advice would you give to the general population to navigate these incredibly choppy waters? I would suggest that everyone have sympathy, emphasize, empathize, and try to understand each other in this time. I think right now my, my main thing would be try to understand and try to get along. Don't maybe right now listen, listen to the, what's being said. And I think the main thing is that like community now, the organization that I um, work with, we do trauma-informed trainings and we do sensitivity trainings, that cultural sensitivity. And I think that's the key right now. I think a lot of people need to hear the truth of Black America. I think that there are a lot of people that don't know what is really going on. And that lack of knowledge is also a part of what is happening. So I think that people need to be um, getting information on Black America, what happened here um, for real, not what's in the books, and that we need to do what Julie said. I think we need to separate at times, we need to breathe, and we need to know that we are all human. We all have vulnerabilities. We all want peace. We should all want peace. And, and how do we get that? How do we gain peace from here? And I think that is the question that's going to move the needle for the United States of America. You know, I'm looking at it from a perspective, um, slightly self-aggrandizing, but when you really look at building the foundation, it comes down to community collaboration and communication. We have to communicate, I mean, and not just use our, our fancy words to make a point and persuade the crowd, but communicate the hurt that we're having, communicate the trauma. You know, sometimes you have to communicate with tears. And I think that as we are able to get that into our communities, as we're able to share, not just in the anguish, but also in the recovery, I think we'll be able to build a foundation that will allow our country to thrive again. Because between the hurt and the pain and the economic consternation we're having right now, um, we're sick. We are sick. And I think the healing will have to come by being very intentional. You know, ladies, I think we could go on and talk about this for, for hours on end, and I'm tempted. But I think um, I wanna end on that point um, because there is the opportunity, using the three C's, but there is that opportunity to heal, recover, and again, thrive as a nation. But from a more local perspective, sure, if you're in the Inland Empire and there's some challenges, trauma's getting to you, your, your community, your child, your better half, and you're finding that the road is a little rough for you as you're just trying to cope with the day-to-day -day grind. How do people get a hold of you? Ah, they can contact uh, communitynow.info on the internet, or they can call our offices at 951-413-6587. That's Community Now, and we can uh, talk with them, and we can work with them and see about different programs and talk about uh, just coping and how to deal with life in this environment. And Julie, I want to thank you so very much for bringing both a local epicenter perspective of some of the trauma we're experiencing as an American culture, uh, but more importantly, bringing in ways for us to achieve healing as individuals through the mental illness work and the, ex and the, and the practice that you have with regards to uh, contributing to the Minneapolis-St. Paul community. Thank you for joining us and bringing a more national perspective to what we're doing here in the Inland Empire. Yes. Thank you guys for having me. Yes. Well, we reserve the right to ask you to return. So That's right. pick us up on it. I'll be back. I'll be back. I look forward to it. Again, I'm Glenn W. Hunter. We have Julie Churcher. 
And of course, Shore Denny of Community Now. More than at any time in recent history, and I can't say this enough, be safe.